organisers for the invitation to speak today. It's absolutely great to be uh, back in Orkney. Um, my name is Gina Wall um, and I work for the School of Fine Art uh, at the Glasgow School of Art. So by way of an introduction, I would say the only thing I can say, because I can never define myself very clearly, is I'm not an archaeologist. Um, I was also a little bit nervous after the first day because I didn't have a map. Erin, um, I think you said you have got to have a map. So I got myself a map, and this map shows the location that I'm going to be talking about today. It's in uh, Murray, which is in the north ish of Scotland, if you compare it with uh, Orkney. And this is uh, the actual location. And never having used a laser pointer before, I'm just going to try one out. And this is where uh, the goal. That I'm going to be talking about lies. So, in order to begin, I would like to revisit a moment which occurred in the landscape of Lossy Forest several years ago. The location is a Forestry Commission plantation in Murray, which is interspersed with the remains of World War II defences. The Forestry Commission describes the location as follows a pretty pine-clad coastal forest that protects a fascinating stretch of World War II defences. I'd been curious about this landscape for many years, but also cautious that it has been frequently photographed, as have many of the, the other British coastal batteries. However, while walking in the landscape, something extraordinary happened. I began to feel that I was being watched. Strange as it may sound, I was so alarmed by the experience that I fled down the path. It was not the first time that this had happened to me. I had similar feelings of dread and fear at the battery at Hawks Ahead in Orkney. And perhaps it should come as no surprise that in locations such as Lossy Forest we feel observed. The structures, after all, were built precisely for this purpose. That is to say, they were built to enable their occupants to see without being seen, as is evidenced by their concrete surfaces, which are so often embellished with pebbles, shells and rocks to provide camouflage. Although these structures have always been rather anachronistic, at Lossy Forest they were out outdated before they were even completed. The strangeness in our experience of such a place uh, as this is at least in part due, I think, to the intersection of leisure and the architectures of war. But I also think there's something more at play here, something which is buried in this notion of seeing without being seen, which I'll return to in a moment. For many people, these concrete monoliths are nothing more than detritus, <coughs> a dangerous vestige of an era that has now passed. In this sense, these crumbling concrete structures are contested heritage sites. But for the purposes of this paper, I would like to propose that the landscape of Lossy Forest is emblematic of heritage in a different sense, that of inheritance in Jack Derrida's sense of the word. I would like to argue that the ghostly sense of being looked at by the holy other is demonstrated in and by this landscape, which furthermore gives us interesting ways in to thinking about the relationship between landscape, <coughs> place and time. And while considering how I might tackle this presentation today, I began to think about the possible overlays of archaeology and photography, and as a result, the neologism archaeography presented itself uh, for scrutiny. Uh, so I, I did a little bit of digging around that and I discovered a piece of writing by Michael Shanks and Connie Svabo which explores the relationships between archaeology and photography. They present the hybrid of archaeography as that which is at play in the intersection between ar archaeology and photography arguing that between the disciplines there is a paradigmatic relationship. They share structural uh, similarities. They state that the disciplines, quote, are processes of site-specific 
engagement of unfolding in the present as a continuity of fragmented or arrested moments characterised by temp temporality of actuality. For Shanks and Svavo, the hybrid hybridity of archaeography is suggestive of associations which leap beyond the disciplines. And thinking about Lossy Forest through this terminology opens the possibility of a site writing where the archaeographical record is literally written into the place as a physical archive. Highly worked, Lossy Forest is inscribed, firstly by the extensive presence of concrete made on site by workers barracked at the location, and secondly, through its overplanting by the Forestry Commission in the post-war period with a, monoc a monoculture of conifer trees. This particular landscape is occupied by and strewn with what Tim Edensor might describe as stray objects. It is a landscape of everyday ruins, completely unregulated. We are free to interact with it as we please. It is a landscape strangely muted in colour, animated by the occasional colourful interlude as a cyclist or dog walker clad in bright outdoor clothing weaves amongst its architecture. Through the forest, flickering glimpses of its participants can be seen from between the serried lines of tank traps, a kind of inverted zoetrope. The lack of regulation makes this a landscape of imagination and play. Edensor argues that in mundane spaces, those unregulated sites of uh, unofficial memorialisation, the figure of the ghost hangs on. Perhaps the ghostly presence is felt in the landscape because this is a place of inheritance rather than heritage. I begin, I begin to wonder if these places remind us of our debt to the other, which is for Derrida a critical <coughs> aspect of this notion of inheritance. In a place such as Lossy Forest, we are scrutinised by the ghost. And Derrida writes, in inheritance there is always this experience which I dubbed the visor effect. The ghost looks at us or watches us. The ghost concerns us. In this landscape of inheritance, perhaps it was the figure of the ghost I felt watching me, unseen from another perspective in a different time. Was it the weight of the gaze of the other which sent me fleeing down the path? Critically for Derrida, the visor effect is dissymmetrical. We are seen by the ghost, but we are unable to reciprocate its gaze. Therefore, the, the visor effect describes the ghostly affect of being seen by an unseen other. Because we feel ourselves seen by someone or something out with our own time, <coughs> the purity of the present is called to question. We experience the present as non-contemporaneous with itself, disjointed. The figure of the ghost disrupts our easy sense of the present, the logic of past, present, future, our faith in the linearity and forward trajectory of time. And as Derrida writes, quote, what has constantly haunted me in this logic of the spectre is that it regularly exceeds all the oppositions between the visible and invisible, sensible and insensible. A spectre is both visible and invisible, both phenomenal and non-phenomenal a trace that marks the presence with its absence in advance. The oppositional structures of past, present, present, future, past, future, are therefore disrupted by the figure of the ghost who comes from both our past and our future. Walking through the forest, the gaze of the ghost forced me to regard the complexities of time in overlaid places such as Lossy Forest and Hawks Ahead, for that matter, the landscape is a tree structure which is haunted by different temporalities, 
which, as uh, Eden saw, states, produce, quote, a series of disjunctions through which the past erupts into the present. In Lossy Forest, this eruption momentarily startled me with an intense experience of the visor effect. Time leaped, past into present, present into future, future into past. I think I was content to seize upon Shanks and Fabo's assertion that archaeography has <coughs> associations beyond their di disciplinary characteristics, because for some time I've been interested in the idea of photography as a kind of writing. And again, following uh, Derrida, photography is grammatological <coughs> rather than representational. Although the photograph seems to bring its subject to presence, in fact, it delays and differs the subject from its image. The subject in the photograph is other from itself. The subject is in différence. It is inscribed in an eternal delay. This is significant here because Derrida asserts that there is something inherently spectral about the medium of photography. He writes, quote, it speaks to me of spectres ghosts and phantoms. It's all about the return of the departed there in black and white. This leads him to describe optical images, photographs, television, film, as follows. As soon as we are captured by optical instruments, we are already spectres of a televised. The, photo the photographic image is a spectrography and there's this word, um, it's a spectral writing, a writing which makes ghosts <coughs> of, of us all. <coughs> so we can argue that there's something essentially spectral about the medium of photography in, being, in terms of being photographed. However, we're also subjected to strange encounters when looking at photographs. One of the most beautiful passages in Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida describes the moment he discovers the ideal photograph in the quest to find the essential image of his mother. Sifting through a box full of photographs, he finds that each one he sees only partially captures his mother's being. When he picks up the photograph of his mother, aged five, he discovers the image he has been looking for. He feels himself touched by the emanation of light from the quote, treasury of rays which emanated from his mother as a child, from her hair, her skin, her dress, her gaze on that day. While I do have many difficulties with Bart's account, there is something here for us to think about with respect to the spectral. That day leaks into our current temporality via via a material contiguity between subject, camera, Im image and viewer. As far as Bart is concerned, we are touched by the light from this treasury of rays. And as Bernard Stiegler writes, quote, these luminous emanations will end up touching my eye. And so there is a series of contiguities which effectively ensures that this thing is looking at me, it is watching me, it concerns me, it touches me, but I can't touch it. So we have the strange sense that the subject in the photograph is watching us. Although we are seen by it, we are unable to return its gaze. For Derrida, it's the fact that the subject in the photograph regards us, which is the source of the reality effect of photography. It's not simply because something or someone real stood before the camera, but rather the reality effect is engendered because we are seen by the other. Although he states that the reality effect may be stronger when it is a human face that is photograph photographed, a landscape can in fact promote a similar response. Therefore, the Bartesian emanation should not simply be thought of a ray of light, but in fact exemplifies the perspective of the other. 
as there is a right, this flow of light which captures or possesses me, invent, invests me, invades me or envelops me, is not a ray of light, but the source of a possible view from the point of view of the other. This is relevant insofar as it acknowledges other perspectives, the sense that at the source of the possible view is another world, which inverts our common thinking about the photograph as the world seen from the perspective <coughs> of the photographer. The operation of the photographic image as a byproduct of a technical apparatus works here in a strange parallel with the landscape of Lossy Forest. As we know, the, the word camera simply means room. The landscape here is populated by many concrete rooms, rooms for seeing. And although ac anachronistic, it, this is still a technological landscape. Bristling with the inf architectural infrastructure of covert seeing, it is a powerful place where we are haunted by the riser effect. In Derrida's words, I can't see who is looking at me, I can't meet the gaze of the other, whereas I am in his sight. The spectre is not simply this visible, invisible that I can see, it is someone who watches or concerns me without any possibility of reciprocity. Caught in the sight lines of the other, I was spectralised within the landscape, trapped in its concrete technology for seeing, which is strangely now partially obscured amongst the forest and overgrown with stray trees and foliage. When photographing the landscape, I feel that although I'm observing the landscape, it is actually the landscape which is looking at me. The ghost is free to roam amongst the tank traps and pillboxes. In this spectral landscape, we, we become part of the polytemporal overlay. Indeed, we might opportunist opportunistically stretch Shanks and Svavo's concept of archaeography to capture the hauntological character of this landscape by haunting the term itself through a ghostly insertion form archaeospectrography. Considered through this terminology, the landscape is a kind of spectral archive in which time feels out of joint, in which we are observed by the other, to use Derrida's words, quote, outside <coughs> of any synchrony. So what can I learn from the experience of being caught in the viewing apparatus of Lossy Forest? from the strong sense of being watched by an absent other. The dissymmetry of the gaze suggests the point of view of another which, as Derrida states, cannot be, quote, reappropriated. Re I cannot assume the other view. I must respect it. He goes on to write, from this infinitely other place I am watched. Still today, this thing looks at me and concerns me and asks me to be responsible. <coughs> As a visual practitioner, this is of significance because this landscape looks at me and asks me to be responsible to it. Perhaps it invokes within me the need to learn to live with our ghosts, both personal and cultural. Our heritage, which is written in the landscape, reminds us of the responsibility of inheritance. <coughs> According to Edensor, coming to terms with ghosts entails a sensuous engagement with place, an engagement which allows for the ingress of the other. It reminds us that place consists of multiple temporalities. It is reassembled variously each and every day. To conclude by returning to Shanks and Svavo, who write, archaeographic experience is constantly on the move in mobile, temporary articulations of place, person, artifact, event. 
and to this we might add the figure of the ghost who troubles the linearity of time and asks us to bear witness to the consequences of our actions, both then, now, and in the future. Thank you. Thank you.